We are in week seven. We're in week seven. And uh, I'm starting to feel pretty much back to my normal self, a little bit more to go. So week seven means that in my IT lab, that was week one. This was two, three, four, and five. This is six and seven. You should be halfway through Excel this week. And uh, under your exams, you should be through chapter seven. And you should do the, the word lab test if you haven't done that already. So that's my IT lab, get all that done. And then over in Blackboard, you have assignments. And you have assignments uh, through week seven. So this week we have a word project and we have programming, that's it. So the word project is super valuable. Really recommend it, spend time with it because that's going to allow you to uh, build a paper which looks well, looks good. Right? And perception is half the battle. Dress for success. Right? If you uh, look at somebody who looks like a bum and somebody who's wearing a suit, which person are you more likely to hire? It might be the bum is actually somebody with a doctorate, you know, and, you know, that guy's just a college professor, so he dresses like a bum. <laughs> or, you know, and the person in the suit just might be a blowhard who, you know, barely got a high school diploma and just dresses in a suit because he knows it makes him more sellable. So it's the same thing, how you present something makes a difference. So this video will teach you how to make your paper look good. And, uh, and you know, that'll help you get better grades. People just look at your paper and think, wow, this student spent a lot of time on this. They really made it look nice. It really stands out. I'm not even going to read it, just A+. Plus. No, they'll read it. But So that's, uh, that's what you have for your assignments this week. Anybody have any questions? My IT lab assignments. How many people have a handle on how this class works and you're doing okay? You're making good progress. Cool. So it's a good half of the class. What's going on with the rest of you? Does anybody need anything? If you do, just let me know and I'll see what I could do to help you out in the class. <clears throat> So uh, today we're going to finish up talking about, we talked about software last week. We also talked about hard drives and storage. And we saw that software is broken up into system software and application software. And we talked about application software last week. So today we're going to talk about uh, system software. So software, system software and application software. Did we talk about uh, system software last week? I don't think we did or did we? Operating system, utilities, drivers, and translators. Yeah, we talked about that. How far did we get into it? I think that's as far as we got, and then we stopped, right? Yeah. Yeah, so anyhow, that's as far as we got, so we'll pick up here. So you have operating system, Microsoft Windows, Mac OS X, Unix. Uh, those are operating systems, okay? iOS. Android operating systems for your phone. So every machine needs an operating system to operate. And the operating system knows how to interface with the hardware. Did you see this last week? Yeah. No. Yes. You did? So the operating system knows how to interface with the hardware. We did see it or we didn't? We did. We did? Okay. And so if you're a piece of application software, you have to be written for that operating system. You don't have to know how to make the hardware work. You just say print it, give it to the operating system, and the operating system knows how to print it. We talk about the command line and graphical user interface. What's the command line? Okay, cool. So we didn't talk about that. So the command line is this. This is the old operating system. Or the old way that we interfaced with computers was through the command line. And uh, the command line, we didn't have graphics. And so with the command line, you just enter commands like print working directory, you know, or uh, list what's in that directory, or list it with details, list, list all. Can you go back to how to get to command line? From oh, in a Mac, you just uh, you have this thing called the spotlight right here and you type in terminal in the Mac. And in um, Windows, you just type in, uh, what do you type in in Windows? 
I think it's command, command prompt. I think that's what you type in in Windows. So the, the command line, you do commands here. And um, that's the old way of interfacing with the computer. The new way, we have all these graphics, right, where we could grab and we could drag things around. It's a graphical user interface. So just something to be aware of. If you go into computers, you'll learn how to use the, the command line because often you could do things in the command line which are just easier than doing it graphically. So the purpose of an operating system is to make your system operate. Kind of a reflexive definition. And here are some of the things it's responsible for. Provides the user interface. It helps boot the computer. Helps get the computer up and running. It manages the hardware. So we saw that picture where the operating system is sitting on top of the hardware. Kind of just, you know, thematic, theoretically as an idea. It's not actually sitting on top of the hardware. But it makes the hardware, it's the layer on top of the hardware. When we think about how do we build this machine. So it manages the hardware. Uh, which means like configuring devices, drivers. Did we talk about drivers last week? What's a driver? So I think I did this example where like if I had an HP LaserJet 1320 driver, and I could go to HP's website and I could download the driver to drive that printer and I could install it on my computer. And then that driver would allow me to, allow my computer to print to that printer. So that's a driver. Allows you to drive a certain piece of hardware. You download drivers. So when we talked about system software, we said system software is made up of your operating system, your, your utilities. Your operating system, your utilities, and your drivers. That's system software. So how many people feel like they could explain what a driver is? How many people do not feel like you could explain what a driver is? So raise your hand up if you feel like you could not explain what a driver is. This game is called The Truth Will Save You. If your hand is raised, I will not call on you. Cool. <laughs> I won't call on anybody. So a driver... Right? Like there's printers in the back of the classroom. How does my computer know how to make that printer work? Every printer is different. How does this computer know how to make that printer work? Well, i got to download a piece of software which tells my computer how to use that printer. And that piece of software is called a driver. It allows my computer to drive that piece of hardware. Not drive like a car, but drive like use it, you know? So that's known as a driver. It's a piece of software which allows your computer to use some other piece of hardware. So you have drivers for all kinds of things, for all kinds of different pieces of hardware. So if you found a printer at a yard sale, let's say I was at a yard sale and somebody had an HP LaserJet 1320, I don't need your discs that came with the printer. Just buy the printer. I'll come home. I'll look it up. At HP's website, there'll be a link for the drivers for this product, right? And then I could say, okay, I want my, my language to be English. I select my operating system. It's a Mac OS X, right? Software is built. Software is built for the operating system because the operating system is on top of the hardware and then software is on top of the operating system. The software, you can't run Mac software on Windows and you can't run Windows software on Mac. If you want to use Microsoft Word for, for Windows, you buy Microsoft Word for Windows. And if you've got a Mac, you got to buy Microsoft Word for Mac. The software is operating system dependent. So when I'm downloading my driver, I'm downloading the driver for my operating system. How do you find out about your operating system or what kind of computer you have? In, on a Mac, you click this little Apple and you choose about this Mac. And it tells me I have OS X Yosemite version 10.10.5. I have 16 gigabytes of RAM. 
and I have a 2.5 gigahertz Intel Core i7. The i7 is 64-bit. Most computers are 64-bit today. <laughs> i7, 64-bit. How do you tell if your Mac is 64-bit? i7 is 64-bit. On Windows, on Windows, you could uh, go to your computer in Windows Explorer and right-click it, and you'll see something like this. And then you could see here, you know, this is an Intel i Intel Intel i7 with 64-bit operating system. Windows 7. 64 bits is the word size. It's how many zeros and ones the CPU can process at one time. Old computers are 32-bit. Back in the day, they were 16-bit or 8-bit. Right? Now they're 64 zeros and ones can be pushed through the CPU at once. Each machine cycle. So we have to get the software which is appropriate for the operating system. So I'd say OS 10, and I just download the software, and then my computer would know, my operating system would know how to print to that printer. How many people feel like they understand drivers now? That help? Anybody still confused? Raise your hand. Cool. So that's what drivers are. So one of the main takeaways is hardware is pretty robust. Like hard disk drives, they have moving parts. That's a fragile point. With the read-write head, you could bang it, you could screw up your hard disk drive. But other than that, hard drive, hardware is pretty robust. Hardware is everything which is hard. You could touch it, you could bang it, you could throw it, you could drop it. Okay, that's hardware. Hardware is pretty robust. And then on top of hardware, we have software, we have the operating system, and we have application software. If you do not like Windows, throw it away. Go get Ubuntu, which is Linux, which is a flavor of Unix, and install that on your hardware. And you no longer have to use Windows. Tell me more. You could run a virtual machine and just run off whatever you want, just partition the hard drive. Yeah, so if you don't like Windows, you could install some sort of virtual machine software, and in there you could install a new operating system, but then you have a whole lot of resources being used to run Windows, to run a virtual machine environment, and then to run another operating system. If you don't like Windows, just get rid of it. <laughs> but virtual machines can be useful in some situations, mostly in a server environment. Uh, virtual machines became really beneficial in server environments because people found out that we have 100 servers and each server runs at 8% capacity. So 92% of what we paid for is not being used. Right? Each server is only running one operating system doing one thing. So then they divided that server up and installed virtual machines on it and keep putting virtual machines on there. Like each, it'll, it's one machine, but it'll act like 100 machines, right? Keep putting them on there until we've used up all the resources of that machine. And that way we could run our machines at 90% capacity. So that's where in like networked environments and, you know, servers and uh, that's where virtual machines became popular. And useful, but that's uh, that's one of the takeaways when talking about software. Is you could just put a new operating system on your hardware, and if you screw up your operating system, put a new new operating system on your hardware. The hardware is okay. You get a bunch of viruses, and your roommate was looking at porn. Your computer's all junked up, and just doesn't run right. 
New operating system, it'll be like brand new. The hardware's still fine, it's just the operating system that got screwed up. Right? If your machine is old, six years old, eight years old, so in 18 months, computers are twice, you buy a computer today, has the processing power of say one. Did I say this last week? In 18 months, computers are the processing power of two. In 36 months, three years, computers are the processing power of four. In 72 months, six years, computers have the processing power of, of uh, 16. 16 times. So in six years, because 18 months, it goes from one, one to two. 36 months, it goes to four. 54 months, it goes to eight. Uh, 64, 72 months, it goes to 16. 72 months, six years, right? So in six years, hardware is 16 times more powerful than when you bought your computer. So if your computer is six years old, it is trying to do, uh, you know, if your computer is six years old, computers that are sold today are 16 times more powerful than your computer. And software is being written to take advantage of that power. So your computer is trying to run current software which requires 16 times more processing power than you got. It's like you were built to lift 100 pounds, and then six years later, they're asking you to lift 1,600 pounds. You're like, no problem. I'm just going to have to take it in 50-pound chunks. It's going to take me a while to carry it all up the hill, right? Current computers could carry all 1,600 pounds up the hill in one trip. You're going to carry it up the hill on 16 trips. It takes you a little bit longer, but you'll get the job done. Kind of describes all computers. Takes you a little longer, but it'll get the job done. Well, if your computer's old, just go get like a light version, Ubuntu light. Right? So you can find light distributions of uh, Linux. Let me search for Linux light. Light, <laughs> easy to use, Linux light distro. They call them distributions. Best lightweight Linux distributions. So you can put on a lightweight operating system and then just use your old computer for just surfing the web or just bit torrenting movies, legal ones, of course. Right? And that, or, you know, doing things that you're concerned would screw up your primary computer because if it screws it up, put the operating system back on it. So do you get it? It's like one of the main takeaways. Hardware, operating system. And that operating system could be anything. And then on top of your operating system, you got install <coughs> application software, which is operating system specific. Specific. When you download this Ubuntu, like Ubuntu, it comes with the application software too? It comes with some software, but then you find other software to put on it. And uh, it comes down as an ISO file. So you have to do burn ISO to disk and uh, be able to create uh, a, a disk from an ISO file. So you just like Windows burn ISO to disk, and it'll show you how to do it. And you burn your downloaded file, which is an ISO file. So it's got the ISO extension as opposed to like a Word document has the DOC extension. All right, you download it and burn it to disk. So you've learned about operating systems, you've learned not to have any fear, screw up your operating system, you put a new one on it. It's a really great thing, just start playing with, you know, uh, new operating systems. You can learn at lynda.com, you can learn, uh, right, you could go to lynda.com and take Unix tutorials, which will help you with Linux you know, slightly different operating system. So have no fear. So files usually have file extensions, which tell the computer what kind of file it is and what software they should use to open it. So we were talking about ISO files. You'll download an ISO file. Word docs have a doc extension. In Windows, You could Google Windows Show File Extension. 
and it'll show you how to see those file extensions. You can right click a Windows file and, uh, and then choose open with and, uh, and you'll always be able to and then choose the piece of software and say always open this type of a file with this piece of software. So for like a JPEG, you could say, hey, instead of opening that in whatever Windows Photo Viewer, open it in Photoshop every time. Okay, every time you click a JPEG, I'll open it in Photoshop. So the file extension is associated with some piece of software to open that file. Open with, in general, my computer doesn't have the software they, they want to use. What? And I need to open with Sometimes it doesn't have software to open something. Yeah, yeah so if you, if you download a Photoshop file and you don't have Photoshop, you won't be able to open the Photoshop file. You'll need the Photoshop. Photoshop. Are you guys ready to go home? Do you want more? Okay. So we've talked about operating system and drivers. Utilities help your computer run well, just like utilities help your house run well. You have plumbing, gas, trash, sewage, electricity. That helps your house run well. Those are utilities for your home. Utilities for your computer help your computer run well, <laughs> like antivirus software. That's going to help keep your computer running well. Uh, some people on Macs don't use antivirus software. I don't use antivirus software on my Mac because the Unix Mac environment is way secure. It's much more secure. Meaning everything you run runs in its own little contained environment and it's really hard to escape that. Plus, it's, some people say that there aren't as many viruses out there for Mac because it's a smaller percentage of the market. So I don't, I don't run antivirus software. But on Windows, you need to run it, because Windows sucks. It's not as good. It's not. But that's not a super informed opinion. It's just my opinion. I didn't study comp sci. I studied business and economics. As Apple's original logo. Funny, huh? Let's look at week six. <coughs> Networks. You guys want more or have you had enough? More, raise your hand. Had enough, raise your hand. <laughs> Let's get week six out of the way and then we'll stop. Do you guys need a break? You need like a video? Rest your mind for 10 minutes. Let's rest our minds for 10 minutes. Do whatever you want. All right, let's talk about networks and then uh, we'll hit chapter seven Wednesday. So uh, here are the basics of a network. First thing is you got to think about the benefits. Why do we like networks? Why don't you guys turn your monitor sideways for 15 minutes? And you can go back to doing what you're doing. Just give me 15 minutes. Focus in. Yeah, so networks allow us to share. We can share information. We can share physical resources. So Facebook is not possible without a network. You're sharing information. Email, not possible without a network. Sharing information. Sharing physical resources. we got two printers back there for the whole room. And you could all print to them. So we're sharing physical resources. So that's the benefit of network, sharing, sharing stuff, whether it's information or physical resources. So network's just connecting a bunch of stuff together. Uh, specifically, it networks two or more devices connected together. That's it, two or more devices. So the cellular network, that's a network. Devices connected together, right? The internet is a network, right? Anytime you connect two or more devices together, you have a network. So the first thing we think about with the network is the connection. We can connect either with wires or wirelessly. 
right? So if we connect with wires, we got three three main choices. We have Ethernet, we have coaxial, and we have fiber optic. So Ethernet is like twisted pair. That's another name for it. Twisted pair is the same kind of wiring they use in the phone system, and it's the same kind of wiring they use in Ethernet. Ethernet's that blue cable going into the back of your computer right there. It looks kind of like a phone jack, but bigger, right? It's RJ45 phone. It's an RJ45 jack. Phone is RJ13. So phone twisted pair has like a couple of twisted pair, and Ethernet has even more, right? And so uh, Ethernet's sometimes also known as Cat5 or Cat6. So Cat6 is the newest kind of Ethernet. So that's one kind of cable. We could use coaxial cable to connect computers. So that's like, you know, if you got cable at home from Comcast, you know, you're plugging that into your modem, uh, and then your modem goes to your router. Sometimes they're the same unit. And, uh, and then out of the router, you sometimes have Ethernet coming out, right? Or it's a wireless router. But you could plug Ethernet into it if you want. So that's another type of connection. And then fiber optics, the final one. Twisted pair, Ethernet, and coaxial all send little impulses of electricity. Fiber optics sends impulses of light, little pulses of light. So it moves at the speed of light. To send something from here to Australia takes less than a second. Pretty amazing. Less than a second from here to Australia. So it moves at the speed of light. Speed of light is that fast. Uh, Fresno to uh, Sydney, Sydney, Australia. Fresno to Sydney, Australia. $1,098. How many miles is it? Los Angeles to Sydney miles. 7,497 miles. Divide by meters a second. Is that meters a second? Speed of light. Yeah, it's meters a second. Meters per second. So how many meters are in a mile? Meters in a mile. Uh, that many meters in a mile. So first we need that many miles turns into that many meters. I want it, don't want it in that kind of a number. That's weird. Is that the same amount? That's the same amount. That's so weird. So it's that far to uh, Sydney from LA and it goes at where the speed of light go? This many meters a second. So if we had 120 miles, we're driving 60 miles an hour, it's going to take us two hours. If we have 12 million meters and we're going at 299 million meters per second, it's going to take us that many fractions of four one hundredths of a second. To send data from here to Sydney, Australia. Whoa. Might be a little bit slower because maybe there's a little bit of traffic interchange at routers or something like that. But that's amazing. That's amazing. All right, so we could connect things with wires. It's one way we could connect things. Or we could connect things wirelessly. And wirelessly is just a wireless router, a Wi Fi hotspot. Right, so sometimes that's 802.11b or a or g or e. You just ask, what's the current fastest standard? There's always some new standard which is faster with some little letter after it. So hotspot wires. There's also wireless connections with Bluetooth. So Wi-Fi has a wider range, more distance than Bluetooth. And uh, Bluetooth is like for personal devices, like my phone and my car. That's Bluetooth, connecting devices together wirelessly. Okay, so Bluetooth is more for a personal area network. 
Wi-Fi is more for a local area network. So PAN, LAN, sometimes there's WAN, wide area network. Like Fresno City College has got a local area network. Fresno City College, Reedley College, Madera, Clovis, they got a wide area network. Bandwidth or throughput, that's how much data we could get through in one period of time to measure, right? So you have at home broadband, broadband, broad bandwidth, as opposed to like dial up, which would be narrow band. So how much can you get through? So when we create a network, we're thinking about the connection. That's the first thing. Wired or wireless? Wired, it's a coaxial, Ethernet, twisted pair, or fiber optic. Wireless, it's like Wi Fi or it's Bluetooth. Uh, then the next thing we think about is how are we going to put it together? That's the topology. Okay, so the topology, old school, is like a bus or a ring. You could actually connect things all on one cable, connect it off of one cable, or in a ring, right, where the cable is circular. The way we do it now is a star. That's called the star topology. You can see it's kind of like a center point. Everything connects to the hub, the router, and the center point. And then all the messages go to that center point and then go back out. So here at, uh, our, at uh, City College, we have something like that. Every computer here goes to a center point and connects to the router. right? And then the router or server coordinates the network. And that way, if one of these cables dies, it's only one machine which isn't connected. Versus on a bus, topology, if the cable dies, everything's screwed up. For a ring, right, well now traffic could only go one way and we have a probability of it breaking. But a star topology is like that. So we think about the cables, we think about the topology, we think about the architecture. So the architecture is going to be client server or peer to peer. So client server, here we have a client, bunch of clients connecting to a server. So client server, architecture, star topology, that's pretty much how you build networks today. But peer-to-peer -peer architecture is still used. Peer-to-peer -peer architecture, anybody know any examples of peer-to-peer -peer architecture? BitTorrent, right? You're not downloading something from a server. BitTorrent connects you to another peer and you download from that other peer. Napster used to be that way. So that's peer-to-peer -peer networking. So that's the type of architecture. Then we have protocols, which are rules of communication. So we all have protocols as humans for communicating. For instance, right now, I am talking, you are listening. That's one of our rules of communication, one of our protocols of communication as humans. I talk facing you, not facing away from you. How weird would this be if I did the entire class lecture looking at the white wall because it's kind of intense for me to see the audience. I'm just going to talk right here. All right? Weird. Violating a human protocol. Computers have protocols too. Right? So HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. FTP, File Transfer Protocol. Rules of communication. So just agreed upon standards about how we're going to pass data back and forth and what we're going to do when there's an error. So we have choose the wire or choose the connection, wired or wireless. We have topology, which is bus, ring, or star. Star is the most popular. We have architecture, which is client, server, or peer-to-peer. -peer. And then we have protocols, which are rules of communication. So just some of the things for putting a network together. And then we have modems and routers. Modem stands for modulate, demodulate. Comes from when we used to send things over phone lines. We have zeros and ones in a computer. We need to send it over a phone line. Phone line takes sound. That's what travels over a phone line. So let's turn the zeros and ones into sound. Uh, zero will be a low pitch. One will be a high pitch. So you tell me, is this a zero, zero or a one? Uh, one. Does that sound low or high? Lower. So that's a zero. Okay. Is this a zero or one? E one. one. Does this sound like an old school modem? Uh, ee, uh, <laughs> right? Lo it's modulating those zeros and ones into sounds. It gets to the other end, it demodulates them, those pitches back into zeros and ones. That's a modem. 
So not all modems send sound these days, right? So maybe the cable modems use something other than sound. Same idea. Like encode those zeros and ones to send over some medium and then demodulate them, modulate them to send them over medium, demodulate them to get them off of the medium. It's a modem. A router allows us to route traffic. So back in the day, before routers, we had hubs and switches. Okay, sometimes switches are still used. Hubs were kind of stupid. They increase in sophistication from left to right. A hub would send out a message to everybody, anybody connected to the hub. If I just wanted to send it to one person, it'd go out to everybody. Everybody would look at it and say, it's not for me, except one person would say, oh, that's for me. That's not very safe. A switch would only send it to one person. A router helps find the fastest route to get it to that person. So back in the day, we had circuit switching. And phones uh, still phones still use uh, some circuit switch, I believe, where they just create a circuit between you and whoever you're calling. And that's just a connection that's established and always on. And you talk back and forth. Uh, so that's like old school operators, right? They'd work in these places where, just a moment, I'll connect you. I'll connect you to the circuit, right? It's kind of weird. Uh, so that was circuit switching. And then we had packet switching. Packet switching came out of the ARPANET Advanced Research Project Agency, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. And packet switching was to allow people to still communicate if there was a nuclear war. Because with circuit switching, if the cable got cut, LA is talking to DC and the cable's going through Denver and Denver gets blown up, you're no longer talking. Cable got cut, that's circuit switching. Packet switching is a network and you break up your message into packets with addresses on them like envelopes and you throw them onto the network and the routers say, hmm, where does this go? This is going to DC. Let's see, can I send it through Denver? No, that's been blown up. I'm going to send it through Houston. And then it goes through Houston or whatever route it can find. Routers find the destination for the packets, and then your computer reassembles those packets. Oh, that's interesting. So that's a circuit switch versus a packet switch network. So that's packet switching. And that's what routers do. They find the route from one place to another place. <laughs> when you're in your home uh, network, you want to secure your wireless router. You want to change your SSID, that's the ID that broadcasts, saying, hey, there's a wireless network here. You could Google funny SSIDs to see some of the dumb ones that are out there. Ultraplex, I'm not going to say that one. Uh, Bill Y, the science Phi. it burns when IP for IP network, internet protocol network. Uh, Belkin, IP setup. HP setup, Airland, Free Public. I don't know what's interesting about that. We can hear you having sex. Donner party, no free internet for you. Very funny. How do I get that lock? Dude, just call Geek Squad. I don't know. So people like FBI Van 234 is one that some people think is funny or something. So that's the SSID. So you want to change it from the default and then change your admin password and then enable some type of encryption so that everything between the two devices is encrypted. What do you look to change it? Thanks. So if I have a link, sys, router, login, or whatever my router is, I just enter the name of the router. And I say, how do I log into it? And uh, it'll say, you know, first connect an Ethernet cable. And then once you've connected an Ethernet cable, right, uh, go to this IP address. So you take that and you put that into uh, your browser window. And since you're connected by Ethernet to your router, 
it figures you must be, right? And uh, it would connect to your router. But then it'll still ask you for a password. So if you haven't entered the password, then it'll be the default password that the router came with. And you could reset your router to uh, reset that password. But then all everything is reset in it. And, uh, and then you could also enter a password and write it on the bottom of the router or remember it. And um, so then once you're logged in, you could change the SSID. You could change the admin password. You can enable encryption. You can disable the SSID broadcast so people won't even know your router's there. It won't be like, hey, I'm here. This is my name. And you can, you can enable MAC address authentication. So MAC addresses, if you go to the command line uh, in Windows, uh, you could type in ipconfig all. And uh, it'll show you, you know, like this computer has, uh, or when I did this, it had this IP address. And no, I want the MAC address. So this MAC address, and then I'd enter that in the router. And only devices whose MAC addresses, and those are unique to every, de every computer, only devices that are listed in your router will be able to use your router. So, you, you know, you can really lock it down. As for me, I just called my router at my mother-in-law's house, dog, and said no encryption, no password, disable SSID broadcast. <laughs> And then anybody who comes over, you just enter dog. It's easy. <laughs> right? But if you keep your Wi-Fi open, people can then get on it and do things. They could download a bunch of stuff they shouldn't. And then, you know, the FBI might come to your house and say, hey, we realize you downloaded all this stuff. And we like, what are you doing? I don't, I don't know anything about it. And then they'll, they'll confiscate your computers and look through them. Probably. The easiest way to hack people is social engineering. The biggest security threat are the people you hired for organizations. You know, somebody who's, you've given access to stuff. Or people call up your grandma. We're calling from Microsoft. There's a problem. We want to fix your computer. You know, do you have a minute so we can help you fix your computer? Can you go to this website and download this and install it? Thank you. Your computer's now fixed. Right, and they just gave access or whatever. So anytime you get a call from your bank or anyone, oh, really, what's your name, what's your number, and then just don't call that number. Call the real bank number and say, I just got this call from this guy at this number. Is there something going on? Never give anything out. Try, better yet, try to get them to give you information. Oh, really? And where do you bank? Why do you want to know where I bank? Well, I'm just curious because you're saying I'm having problems with my bank. I'm curious where you might bank. What, what do you recommend? Are you having problems with your bank? What's your password? <laughs> All right, so that's networks. Cool, so we got through week six. Next Wednesday we'll get through week seven. You guys are welcome to pack it up early and go. Anybody have any questions? Let's get out of here. I'm still not 100% energy. <laughs>